Today we're going to skim through the operation manual for your nervous system. Yes, that's a big book, a big, big book that we're never going to finish, but let's get started with it today with Dr. David Hardy, a functional neurologist and the host of the Hardy Brain Podcast. He's going to teach us about breathing techniques, eye, jaw, and mouth movements, smells, and so much more. Plus, we tie all this back to concussions, sports, music, and life. Let's solve some of these mysteries of your nervous system with the Hardy Boy for your brain, David Hardy. So, first of all, I'd like to kind of get the story of David David Hardy. Uh, I'll sketch it out a little bit yes. myself first, and then I'd like you to kind of fill in the details, maybe edit things, because um, I only have a, a small picture of it. But what I understand is, well, for example, when you were a kid, you had th- these are the details that stuck in my mind that I like to highlight. You you got in this little bike accident, so you got a little bit of a head injury, perhaps. Uh, you played sports. I think you played basketball, may- maybe rugby. I could be wrong. This is where you need to do the editing. Um, and you had sort of these uh, some kind of um, small brain injuries, and that might have led to um, uh, certain uh, maybe anxiety or uh, vision problems, uh, reading and speaking problems, perhaps. Uh, I should probably let you be telling the story, but I, I'd like to try it myself. And uh, and then you went to university, and you had a professor or somebody who who kind of gave you these um, this sort of toolkit of exercises. I don't know what they were exactly, if they're eye exercises or um, something else, but that kind of cleared up your vision and, and, and got things, um, a lot of your nervous system kind of uh, rolling again in and, and, and a positive direction. And then I guess you, you studied um, uh, neurology, you're a functional neurologist, and um, you're helping people um, kind of fix these um, parts of their nervous system uh, via uh, sort of these behavioral tools of, of, of movements and um, light and sound and all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, I'll let you take it from there. You probably need to do a complete re-edit of my uh, my first draft of your story. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, comment on that and, and and sort of fill in the relevant details. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, from an early age there, um, I was... Uh, uh, one, one of those children that, that struggled with things. And, uh, so definitely more on the neurodevelopmental, uh, spectrum than to some extent. Right. Uh, so it, it kind of manifested, started out with being one of those sensitive kids and, uh, who of course got bullied a little bit more and, uh, had a, had a speech issue as well. So, uh, I remember, yeah, kind of those, <laughs> those young early days, uh, being in speech therapy. And then of course, uh, had an older brother. So he, he, he picked on me a bit and, uh, and other things. And yeah, it, it was definitely frustrating. And, uh, I wouldn't say maybe the, the most joyous childhood. Um, but yeah, a lot of other things were really good with it. Um, however, yeah, some of those struggles, uh, were, were definitely challenging as a, as a youngster there. And, uh, I, I was in a lot of kind of reading uh, programs throughout school as well to to try to improve that aspect of of school life. Um, but all the subjects that I liked and enjoyed, I, I was really good at. Um, so yeah, it was kind of this frustration with some things and then excelling at, at the things I liked and uh, being more serious and being more sensitive as a kid. And uh as far as concussions go, though, um, yeah, and not uncommon like a lot of kids is that the the most common form of concussion that happens is is a bike accident, and um, I remember this this one I had uh, where I was uh, <laughs> racing a friend, and he was on the street, and I was on the sidewalk, and we're on our BMX bikes. And then all of a sudden, uh, a neighborhood girl runs in front and we smash and, and just go over the handlebars and God. yeah, skinned myself and uh, everything else. And then uh, the the odd thing was uh, that, uh, yeah, when I'm recovering at, at home and 
in my my bed as a kid uh then i started to get sick and throw up and become dizzy and and all those things and we went to the emergency room and of course back then it was okay well is there a brain injury meaning more like skull fracture or neck injury so I had all the x-rays and and then sent home <laughs> and that was that um don't remember too many lingering symptoms with with that first concussion but you you don't know as a kid right and uh then on top of it having those learning challenges but that was kind of the the extent i guess for for that childhood period of time um and yeah i was in, involved in some sports as well uh, soccer basketball you mentioned and then later in high school uh, i played football in grade 10 and basketball was my main sport and then uh Later on, I, I figured I could combine the two sports and found rugby. And yeah, it was the contact with all the ball handling skills, running and reaction that that these other sports I had that I enjoyed versus the stop start ones. And that just became my my passion then from from a sports sense. And it took me around the world. Uh, <laughs> amazing sport that way. Uh, so I uh, I played some high levels and played with or against professional players at at some some point in time and in, in kind of my my uh, career journey with with rugby if you can call it a career it <laughs> weekend warrior syndrome anyways and yeah I was able to to play oh you know, in, in Canada where I grew up all all throughout different provinces um, then. Australia, I played a little bit when I when I went down there, and uh, a bit in the states, and took me in university too. Played, and then uh, the the major major part of rugby though was the camaraderie and the friendship with people. On top of it, um, but I did receive a couple concussions. Uh, the first one with it was. Uh, I got dump tackled and planted on the back of my head and remember being a little dizzy and shaken up and taken off the field. And then the other one was more bizarre though. It was, uh, I, I don't think I ever fell. Don't think I ever hit my head. Uh, was in a contact situation though, stayed on my feet and then realized later on in the game that things just weren't right. And, uh, yeah, sort of hum and hawed whether I should stay on the field or not. And eventually was taken off. But it wasn't uh, kind of one of those major incidences where people collide or anything. It was I kind of got twisted and thrown or nudged in the wrong way and recovered, stayed on my feet. And then later it was like this wow, things are just not processing, right? My vision's kind of gone hazy and uh, <laughs> and I'm I'm a bit of a mess. And this is before the, the clinical side of things. So at this point in time, I'm teaching and teaching took me around the world as well. I, I taught in Australia, Japan, and uh, I taught uh, behavioral students in, in Alberta where I, where I lived and grew, grew up. And I, I joke around. I saw every single neurodevelopmental disorder before uh, going into the clinical side of things, and just how yeah these kids struggled as I did, and uh, even more so, and were stuck in these situations of bad environment on top of it, or um, and really really felt for them, but. I saw a shelf life to it and because uh, it, it was high, high intensity with, with teaching, teaching those, those, that group of kids that uh, there is always fires to be put out, kids blowing up and reacting. And, and uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back to a regular classroom after having the fun kids. So I uh, got talking more and more with a couple friends that were 
also teachers that played rugby and had, had switched careers, which was like one or two of them. And, uh, I thought I could get partial scholarship by playing rugby, um, at one of the chiropractic colleges down, down there, at Atlanta, Georgia life university. So, uh, I toured the facility and then next thing I know, I was signing up for, for my first semester down there and, uh, went down, uh, However, uh, uh, the, the season was wrapping up in Alberta before I went down and I had uh, torn my pec minor and probably completely off um, in a big swinging arm tackle and then staying in the game because that's how stubborn I was and, and uh, how little I knew about how bad I injured myself and struggled through one season down there. And yeah, I wasn't getting the playing time. Shoulder was always a mess, always hurting. Mentally, I was done with it. And I hung up the boots. But it became one of the best things because then I found these uh, these postdoctorate courses and this, this on, on, on-campus club with functional neurology. And at first I was like, what's this? Uh, yeah, I came down here for kind of the uh, aches, pains and sporting injuries. And what, what's this got to do with the brain nervous system? And, uh, and mm-hmm. it was this eye opening part of the profession and, and things that just opened up and connected everything from the athletics, the, the rugby, the contacts, the concussions to what I was doing, teaching, uh, the behavioral issues I, I saw with, with these kids, uh, the neurodevelopmental problems, um, was that, yeah, if you learn about the brain and nervous system, then there's this huge, huge world of how to get it better. And, uh, Each exercise, each stimulation, adjustment, uh, therapy, um, whatever activity, all work because they stimulate the nervous system in a different way. And if you figure out what's going on with the brain and nervous system, then you can use a combination of tools and exercises, modalities, whatever, to to get the, the brain and nervous system working better and and functioning better from pathology to performance. And it's just been, been this amazing journey to figure that out ever since and still learning, of course, because the field continues to expand and, and pick up more and more things that, that help people and ease that suffering that, that I had felt, whether it was physical, emotional, or, or growing up with delays. And it's... It's been been a wild ride, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm very eager to get into these actual exercises, the solution to these brain um, problems, if you want to call them that. But first, let's I I want I want to um, step back and 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 uh, dig into more of the the problem first. When you were telling your story, uh, which I'm so glad you did, because there was like a billion gold nuggets in there, and, I, and now I'm like overwhelmed <laughs> with where to go with this. My brain's like, whoa. Uh, but the first thing that happened was when you were talking, um, a couple of my uh, early memories of, of, uh, of head traumas, uh, popped into my head. Uh, luckily they weren't me myself, but one was when I was a kid, I must've been five or six years old. This kid across the street was riding his bicycle. I was right up next to him and he just hit the curb with his front wheel. He cracked his head on the sidewalk and he was just walking around. His blood was dripping from his head. His mom came out and I was like, whoa, (sighs) I mean, I don't know why I'm telling these stories, but this is like one of my early memories. And I I don't know if that shaped me or not. But anyway, whoa, wow, Um, definitely shaped him. And then uh, in the university, we were at some concert. It wasn't even a great concert, but that's beside the point. Afterwards, (laughs) you know, this this friend I was with, this sort of friend of a friend, um, I guess uh, maybe he got head trauma as a kid too, because what he ended up doing, he ended up fighting this guy and he, he tombstoned this random dude into the sidewalk, you know, you know what a tombstone is, but you know, it's cracked his head vertically down to the ground. I'm like, dude, you can't be doing wow. that. You can't be doing that. That was, and I saw that. I'm like, these are two memories where I'm like, 
God, yeah, this is bad news. That's um, I don't need to share those, but but that that the, those those images flash into my head. Yeah, they they pop into our heads. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us have witnessed them, and uh, and then we don't know what happens to that person. And uh, quite often, if we do, we just know that yeah, there's something a little different. So, but you feel the sadness. You're like, is this yeah. sadness? You feel, like, oh God. Um, but the thing with those those um, injuries probably actually had some physical um, uh, trauma to the to the brain. I'm sure if people like imaged and looked at the brain, they say, okay, there's physical damage here. In those cases, I, I, I'm guessing. But with concussions and with um, in your case, a lot of times there is no physical damage. It's like you have this phone and you drop your phone and you pick it up and oh, it looks fine. You get in your car and you kind of get a little fender bender and oh, the car looks fine. But then the car is not really working as as it used to, and the phone's a little bit a little bit broken, but it looks fine on the outside. And so that's sort of like what's happening with um, with these concussions as well, right? And as well as with these other neurodevelopmental disorders and um, overall kind of uh, things like ADHD and things like uh, OCD and all these other uh, conditions, um, you might not visibly be able to see anything structurally, physically wrong with the brain or the body, but um, it, or same thing with concussions. But it does change. It does change the way the brain and the body and the nervous system works. So, um, can you talk about that and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong? No, you're absolutely spot on with that. Is that yeah? Most scans, um, they're looking at like the size of the brain and they're looking for things that are acute damage, like a stroke or or a bleed, something something more sinister that that's going on. But in a concussion, yeah. There's damage that physically is there, um, more at the microscopic level and more at basically jostling around this this uh, big supercomputer that's sending all sorts of signals and commuting, communicating to all sorts of different pathways and figuring out the world around you and your inside body and matching that up and meshing it. Um, so yeah, the the concussions they they don't traditionally fall into the normal kind of treatment protocols that, that are out there, and how this all relates to the neurodevelopmental disorders like the ones you mentioned, like ADHD, OCD, all of these. Um, if you look at some of the concussion forms, the the pre assessment forms, um, a lot of them have that in the history. Do you have a history of mental illness? Do you have a history of ADHD, OCD, whatever? And the reason is basically what's going on is some of those pathways just aren't firing as well as they should be. And well, it's kind of like if you had a weak muscle and let's say it's your right bicep and we put you out in a game that you're going to be thrown around and using all your muscles to full extent, what muscles most likely to get injured? Probably the right bicep. <laughs> well, same with some of these pathways. Some of these pathways are just weaker or overactive or underactive, and they're more likely to be damaged when there, there's something going wrong with it. Um, so the real amazing thing with the functional neurology and the neuroscience is the pathways are pretty much the same. The mechanism of how they get damaged or how they don't develop properly or how they decline later in life um, are different, but the pathways are relatively somewhat the same. And they've got the same inputs and the same outputs. And that's been noted in, in textbooks on the neurologic examination. And it's kind of these functional tests you do that you're not necessarily looking for pathology. You're looking for ways that the system just isn't working properly. Um, so then you can exercise and fire into that pathway that's, that's just not working well or find a way to calm it down or to be inhibited so it's not overactive. And that becomes that million piece puzzle that, that, um, really is that skill part is the assessment. And then some of the treatments are, are simple, but it, figuring it out is, is the difficult part. And, and it's the neglected part in a lot of, 
lot of treatments and therapies out there. But yeah, there's, there's this million piece question that I'm going to ask you too, uh, which I'll have a million piece answer to it. But right. um, how, how can we detect sort of uh, inefficiencies or uh, uh, problem problems in our brain, um, things not working as, as they optimally would? Um, how, what are some ways mm-hmm. to detect this? And, and are there ways to, to find and discover like specifically what's wrong? Uh, for example, this hemisphere, or that hemisphere, or this part of the brain, or this, this network, so that we can kind of tailor the exercises to this um, particular um, region or um, uh, problem, if you want to call it that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, the, the neurologic examination is kind of the, the key one. So once again, there's textbooks on it. And uh, a medical neurologist will, will run these t- simple kind of bedside tests, looking at eye movements, reflexes, coordination, balance, gait, all of these that tell us about different pathways in the brain. To simplify that million piece puzzle though, uh, let's rewind and just make a basic model of how the brain works and functions. And by brain, I also mean nervous system. So the way the brain works is kind of this bottom up and then top down um, circuitry. So what happens is we have all these receptors, whether it's vision, whether it's hearing, whether it's taste, whether it's sound, um, whether it's movement, whether it's pressure, whether it's touch, all of these are sending so many signals up to the brain. So the first part of the brain nervous system is to receive information, input. And then it gets processed in the brain. And then you have an output. So another analogy would be like, yeah, If you're on a podcast, you've got the microphone that's taking in information. It goes to the computer, it's processed, and then you've got a wire that sends it out to a speaker. All right, so input, processing, output. Now, with the brain and nervous system, same thing, all this sensory information. and It takes a lot of sensory information that we're conscious about to be processed so we can make a decision. And then... Those decisions come out basically in two, three forms, thoughts, emotions, and then physical. So those physical ones are the ones we want to look at. Those physical ones being basically all the nerves coming out of the brain, going to the body, sending information to the body, go to only two spots. They go to either muscles or to glands. So the output of the brain is to move or not to move, do something, uh, change hormones, change your heart rate, change your digestion, and that's the output of the brain. So yeah, we can put an input in and heart rate variability is a good example. All right, well, we put an input in, does it increase the heart rate or does it decrease the heart rate? We can look at a concussed athlete. Oh, we move them too quickly and all of a sudden their heart rate drops and then spikes through the ceiling. Okay, well, we know something's going wrong there. Um, We could look at facial tone. So basically, facial tone tells us the emotions of people and that affect on the face. Um, There's a lot of information coming out and, uh, and a lot of devices now that will quantify this. So just like we can quantify heart rate, there's devices coming out to quantify facial expressions, pupil sizes, pupil reactivity, and then how people walk and move. Um, There's tests in the Parkinson index with coordination or speed of movement. So that's that hardcore pathology. We already know that, yeah, the way somebody walks when they have Parkinson's is not a way a normal person should should be walking. Well, if we back that down and we know that a lot of that movement pattern is also affected in concussions, we sometimes see changes in how people walk as well. So there's all this information coming out um, just by observing, once again, the, the body, facial expressions, the autonomic nervous system, like heart rate, blood pressure, um, 
blood perfusion, pupil sizes, and eye movements. Um, eye movements um, can affect vision because, yeah, if the eyes are not yoked together or there's an issue with how the eyes track something, then you're going to get that blurriness too when you do things. And that system fires into our awareness of our outside world too. So yeah, if we're seeing things move by us and we can't process that information, then we've become disorientated. And you'll see these in athletes. Yeah, they turn one direction or they move their eyes one way and they're kind of spacey. <laughs> they're, they're not quite there. And uh, then they're a target because when that happens, even if it's a split second, when they're disorientated, they're more prone to be, be hit harder and not be able to react to that hit or to that movement. And it's kind of like me when I was on the rugby field, staying on my feet, getting jostled in the wrong way or looking the wrong direction from how my nervous system had compensated for previous injuries or whatever else. Um, it went haywire. <laughs> and and then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm back at square one, like, okay, wow, something's wrong here. And uh, then you get all that emotionality that comes with it and the bizarre thoughts. And it's it's a nightmare. It's it's brutal. Yeah. And a lot of people feel that. And, 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 and rugby has um, has more concussions than, than any other sport, I, I think, right? Um, Maybe not. It is a high concussion sport. High um, Looks dangerous. And uh, there's sev several other high concussion sports out there, that's for sure. Um, in, in some aspects, though, um, sometimes when you're, you're skilled in contact situations and it's known that you're going to go in a contact situation, mm -hmm. that sometimes people are better able to, to react to it. Whereas in some of the non-contact sports where an uncontrolled collision happens, um, they're not braced, they're, they're not yeah. ready for that contact. And that's where I see a lot of those, those big concussions also occur. Yeah. Or, or not even a sport, uncontrolled um, contact, a collision in life, in, in a car, uh, on the stairs, yeah. uh, these kinds yeah. of places as well. Right. right. Exactly. But let's go back to what you were talking about with the um, with all these sort of sensors on our body. This is really really fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, we have like little we have smart watches, we have VR smartphones. Yeah, we have these little cameras around our life, but these are like nothing compared to this full body of thousands and I don't know how many sensors we've got. And they're not only these um, input devices. But there are also these output devices, what you're talking about. So you can read what's going on with the body and the brain and the nervous system by looking at the eyes and looking at the hands and looking at the face. But also by by moving your eyes and, and moving your I don't know, hands and breath and all of these things is this input device. So you can, it's just, wow, what a magical little um, uh, technology that is. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And you, you think about it, how much sensory information comes in, like if somebody just asks you a question, a yes or no question. How much information are you taking in to make that yes or no response? Like if somebody asks, oh, what are, what are you, are you going to do this this weekend? You're like, uh, I've got this, I've got that. Um, it's way over there across town. Um, I need to drive this way. Like the overthinkers are automatically <laughs> thinking of a million other things right now. <laughs> so there's a ton of sensory stuff that comes in before we make even a yes or no decision. And a lot of these movements or thoughts are basically a yes, no answer. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do it or no, I'm not. I'm going to move that way or no, I'm not. <laughs> so uh, the output part sometimes becomes easier than, than looking at all this sensory bombardment we get. And, uh, and that's too how people become overloaded is that this processing just doesn't uh, happen efficiently or smoothly. It's too much for us. And uh, like when I was teaching and I had the, the room full of behavioral kids, I had like my street kids who had a horrible upbringing in life and exposed to violence and trauma. And then I'd have um, some that were like, 
abandoned or poor family situation. Then I'd have others that were on the the autistic spectrum. And uh, there was one one Christmas we started decorating the room, and uh, we pulled out all the glitter, all the garland, the lights, everything, and we're hanging it up. The ornaments. Kids are having a great time, except <laughs> for my one autistic child who comes up and he is tripping out because it is just too much for him. He's overloaded. He doesn't feel right. He's like dizzy. And <laughs> and it was just for him, it was like Christmas just puked all over his God. his sensory brain that could not <laughs> handle it. <laughs> and, sure. Acid trip. <laughs> this happens like after a concussion too, right? Like, mm. oh, I'll, I can't walk outside without sunglasses on. Um, I, it's too much for me. Or, yeah, I can't move too fast in that direction anymore. Or how about when we decline with age? Like how many seniors going to the supermarket, just walking down the aisles with all that visual stimulation and sets them off. And uh, it's, it's a major, major problem. And when we go into all these different brain disorders too, um, uh, it was, it was one of the, the interviews I had um, uh, about the, the brain, uh, brain capital innovation. Mm. And uh, the, the the gentleman goes, yeah, we, we did, we crunched some numbers in, in Europe and uh, basically the numbers we came up with for brain disorders dwarfed cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. <laughs> and yeah, you look at some of the numbers now and uh, it's in the trillions of dollars, the economic impact that this is causing society. It's, it's massive and there's a lot of people struggling and not just the ones struggling, but also all the people looking for just to improve their lives or maybe they're going for something and they've got that drive, but there's something else holding them back and they're just not sure what it is. And it's, it's maybe not completely physical, um, not completely mental. Well, that's probably a good sign that it's neurologic. So it's okay. Well, how do we make the changes to, to these parts of the brain and nervous system and improve performance, improve how we feel function and live. Yeah. And we could take this sort of top-down approach, uh, which sometimes works. Uh, it seems to be the popular route. We have <laughs> right. this belief that our, that our prefrontal cortex, that our, our neocortex can kind of, um, that that's the most powerful part. But it sounds like what you're saying too, is these sort of lower, more primitive, um, not primitive in a, in a um, sort of, oh, they're not as powerful way, but in, there's older pathways that we share with reptiles and, and mammals and other animals. Um, you know, the, the brainstem, the cerebellum, um, the overall limbic system, this is sort of, um, running a lot of the show. And, um, when we're doing these exercises is, is, is it, I guess, I guess we're kind of uh, changing these parts primarily. Maybe we shouldn't think about it as parts, but we, we can, um, yeah. How do we, how do we change the system? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, we always talk about dopamine and serotonin, right? Like, Everyone out there is like, oh, it's a dopamine hit. Oh, I need need my serotonin. And uh, yeah, it's a good analogy to name chemical, but that chemical is is a signal in the brain. And guess where the major centers that produce these signals are? They're in the brain stem. Yeah. And they fire up into... So the next stop after sensory processing is going to be emotions, our limbic lobe, and then our frontal lobes. So basically, that's the reason why we feel before we think. All right, this information comes in and it automatically creates this response in our nervous system. And then we get this feeling, this emotion from it. And then we get a thought. And then, yeah, with that thought, if it's clear enough, then we can make a decision. It's like, okay, no, I'm not in danger or or that was no big deal, or wait, wait, yeah, I, I need to go do something. Um, but the majority of times there, all of that's happening 
before we consciously are aware of it. We get this autonomic response. Yeah, hormones are going to be signaled to be produced or not produced. Um, heart rate's going to change. Muscle tension's going to change. Eyes, they're going to move different directions in response. <laughs> And all of this is occurring without us being consciously aware of it. And then when we are, yeah. yeah before, we, you, before you're even aware of it, like things are happening. You're taking these actions. Things are happening. And then you kind of, you kind of wake up to this, whoa, what is going on? Um, and there yeah. are some examples. There are some, some times when you're really reflex-based, when you notice this, you're like, oh my God, wow, what yeah. is this? Yesterday I, I, uh, yesterday I was on the train. Um, I did not, I did not choose this experience and I, I don't, maybe some people would choose this experience and it's hard, hard to know how to react to this kind Here, of thing. Here's the thing. You never do choose these experiences. <laughs> Most of these experiences are not chosen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was on the train and it was a packed Japanese train, right? And there's this beautiful woman standing in front of me and, you know, okay, cool. Yeah. Beautiful woman. Yeah. 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 Um, but then she's leaving the train and somehow she gets I don't know if this happens, things, pieces move around. And next thing I know it, she literally falls onto my lap. But but before she does that, I, my hands brace up and push her away. And you're thinking, why are you pushing a beautiful woman away? Why, why shouldn't you let her fall into your lap? Like literally? Like, <laughs> no. My, like my body's like, no. More important, like save this woman, save yourself. Like, but my, right. my logical brain would probably be like, my teenage brain would be like, dude, let her fall in your lap. <laughs> but like, I woke up to this experience, like what the, my hands are just up and she's just kind of there, like hovering above me. I'm like, what is going on? I definitely did not choose that experience. Like I said, many people would choose that. Um, but I right. also didn't choose how to react to that. And I probably shouldn't be sharing the story. It makes me sound like some weird train creeper, but I like, it's a bizarre <laughs> experience. And I thought, whoa, it was going on. A woman literally fell in my lap and I just like, I kind of gave her a little back support to keep her up so she wouldn't fall. Um, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then, then afterwards, my brain's thinking like, what, what what's, what's going, what's going on? What do you, it was such a trippy experience <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's, it's, it's two conflicting different emotions, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. And then we, we, we have regrets mm -hmm. sometimes or we have, uh, we, we think, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. But really, um, our habits and the, and the way our, our, we've reacted in the past, the, the, the inputs we've gotten, um, the way our nervous system is wired, that's what's sort of running the show. And I guess through daily, uh, ongoing, uh, exercises and movements, we can change that, but it does require some, um, of these sort of um, ongoing uh, movements to, to change how we will act and how we will think in the future. Um, otherwise, we're kind of just controlled by by the past, I, I believe. So we could go into these top-down um, tools, but I, I, if what you're saying is right, the brainstem and these lower structures uh, are controlling more of the show, it's more powerful for us to go kind of bottom-up. And one way to go bottom-up is, is, is through um, these actual um, uh, input devices, uh, our eyes, our, our mouth, um, and different things. And uh, so I like to, actually, this is the thing I was most excited about uh, uh, to talk to you about yeah. is, is, is this. So yeah, um, eye exercises, breathing exercises. Um, from what I understand, you're saying that the breath is, is sort of the key one. So maybe we can start with that. What are some breathing exercises and, and how, they, how, they, how they will, uh, different ones we can use for different purposes, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the, the first key of any really rehabilitation for the nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. So heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, digestion, um, all of the things we can't control. So you always want to look at that system first. And that's why heart rate variability is such a good one, but breathing as well. And breathing is involuntary until we think about it. And that's the beauty of it is that, yeah, it autonomically responds Two, basically, our arousal changes our breathing and our set rate when we're just calm and chill. What should our breathing be like? But of course, we can reprogram it in all sorts of <laughs> maladaptive ways. <laughs> and that's usually what ends up happening. And but two, if we practice things, and that's why the different breathing exercises work, work differently on us is yeah, we can start to change part of that autonomic nervous system, which then fires into all these other systems. And the breath is a great way to do it. And 
there's so many different breathing exercises out there from relaxation. So just breathing in through the nose and then nice relaxed out through the mouth twice as long just to calm us down. There's like circular breathing where it's kind of that same timing, but we're also concentrating on how the ribs move and how the spine moves and kind of reprogram it that way as well. Um, there's breathing techniques out there that have been published, uh, different articles on how the Navy SEALs calm themselves down. Um, well, yeah, you look at somebody who's about to aim a, a, a rifle and needs to be very precise. They need to change their heart rate, their muscle tone, their nervous system to be able to actually make that. And you look at like biathlon in the Olympics, what a sport that is. Like they go from going full out cardiovascularly to having to lie down there, calm themselves down in, in a moment to, to make this skilled shot at a target and then get up and rinse and repeat and do it again. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of ways we've learned to, to condition ourselves and to do this and breathing practices have been around for, oh, hundreds, thousands of years too. Um, there's like holotropic breathing where you're breathing so much and, and, and in a different way where you start to produce all this activity in that part of your brain that then kind of makes you feel like you're, you're on a high and then uh, Wim Hof breathings become really popular as well. And that's one too, that all these breathing centers in that brainstem become very stimulated very quickly. And not only do you get that free, delicious oxygen, but you're also getting that huge stimulation into the brainstem and that part of the nervous system. And, uh, the breathing centers there are kind of in that mid part of the brainstem, which is going to be more about body sensation. Um, whereas if you go a bit higher up, then you get into the midbrain, the mesencephalon, which is more dopaminergic, more alertness. And usually the breathing you get with that is very anxious, hyper shallow breathing, right? <laughs> and you'll see people that have reprogrammed themselves where they're very shallow breathers, where the muscles in the front of their neck are all tight and you can see them move with each little breath. And there's very little rib movement because they're these shallow, anxious breathers. And then what that also does is it reinforces it. It changes the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And then all of a sudden, while well, you're leaching more calcium out of the system because you've changed your blood pH and now the muscles are uh, firing a lot quicker because they've got this calcium floating around because of the abnormal breathing. And then that reinforces the parts of the brain that are in this fight flight mode. And then you become sympathetically stuck. And well, you can take a train and <laughs> you can look at anyone and you'll observe that. <laughs> it's just rampant out there. So yeah, breathing is one of those easy techniques that you can pick up right now yeah. and start to make a change to yourself. And some of them will uh, uh, kind of ramp up the sympathetic nervous system. We normally do these ones naturally, um, the ones you're mentioning, sort of shallow breathing, mouth breathing. Right. And then there, there are these sort of uh, deliberate ones like holotropic breath work and Wim Hof breathing and the lion's breath these um, kinds of ones and there are a bunch of others. And then, um, but it seems like a lot of those ones you were mentioning were about kind of activating the sort of relaxing uh, parasympathetic uh, mode of ourselves. That this breathing in through our nose, um, you know, focusing on the exhale more, that kind of thing. Is that, is that, is that right? Absolutely. Um, it, it seems we're always more in that sympathetic dominant state. And well, especially in modern human life right and uh it's trying to get that rest and recovery because as much as i'd love to stay up oh 16 hours and be just on the ball alert typing out things and and doing sports <laughs> running marathons 
uh, eventually you whip that horse to death. <laughs> like yeah. that's when people burn out and that's when the system crashes and that's way too late. And yeah. I say all this, but I've done it to myself too. Well, it feels really good. It feels really good yeah. and it's addictive. And it's like that high, uh, that dopamine mm-hmm. high of being in a sympathetic land. Um, like you see people on the train, they're, they're actually, they need, they need rest. They need to, to yes. close their eyes and just relax. But instead they're playing this crackhead video game. And it's kind of fun to be a crackhead until you get the rebound effect the next day. But then you, you take more crack and if it's basically the society is just like all like people are overrunning their nervous systems because it does feel good and it is a quick fix. Um, but you can, get, you can get trapped there very easily because it, it does feel really good in, in a very grungy uh, kind of way and then the, it's not always crunchy it's sometimes it actually, actually it's pure high but that doesn't last that long <laughs> but then uh, we get kind of right. stuck in this grungy little land that's I, I think grunge is a good word for it but um <laughs> yeah we're kind of stuck there yeah like you you look at it like the, the person who starts out with a cup of coffee to wake themselves up and then a glass of wine to go to bed and then it turns into a pot of coffee to stay awake and then a bottle of wine to knock yourself out And then, of course, when you do that, then you can't sleep properly anyways because of the inflammation. And then you're then you're on to harder stuff. Then you're like, okay, well, now I need need some pills to stay awake. And it it just becomes this rampant mess. And yeah, um, I just got (laughs) got done interviewing uh, one prominent uh, PhD out there. And he's like, A lot of it, I don't think, is a mental health crisis. It's a physical health crisis as well. And uh, I think we're really missing the boat on that and uh, need to to make some changes on how we take care of ourselves if we want to make the world a livable place again. But regardless of where we are, we can uh, use these breathing techniques to instantly sort of um, snap us toward that uh, more relaxing, uh, slower heart rate, more calm kind of um, state, the parasympathetic state. Yep. And we could we can also go, ramp things up with our you know by breathing harder and shallower. Uh, but normally we don't we don't need that. We have tons of tools, technologies, and drugs, and all kinds of things um, to kind of um, get us to where we want to be. But it seems like these 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 tools, these drugs, and technologies and stuff uh, push us into the other uh, side of the nervous system almost too quickly in an unnatural way, where where um, it it, it, it it kind of busts the system a bit. So yeah, I I do believe that these these behavioral tools like breathing and eye exercises are a more gentle kind of natural way to kind of shift us into the uh, different mode. You know, whether if it's nighttime, maybe we need to calm down and sleep. So we use certain breath movements or eye movements. Uh, if we're looking to get work done and focus, we might uh, need to do the opposite and and crank up the nervous system. Um, yeah. Um, what are some of the um, eye movements? Um, this is something I I, I really actually I think love the most um eye movements for these two purposes I guess it's more than two purposes but yeah one 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 side is yeah the sympathetic mode the parasympathetic mode cranking up the nervous system calming it down but it might be doing more than that too but let's start with that and then I want to dig into some of the uh, finer details perhaps yeah so um often when we start mentioning the eyes people automatically turn to light and vision and of course, that's going to stimulate your your optic nerve and and go back in the brain and have that effect. And yeah, that's very important. But also, we can look at the way the brain moves the eyes, and those are going to be different cranial nerves. So different nerves coming out of the body to control different muscles, different positions. And that's the cool thing about eye movements is different eye movements will tell me about different parts of the brain. And... Uh, So, for instance, uh, think of hypnosis. You're following that watch. It's nice, calm, trying to put you in a hypnotic state. Well, horizontal eye movements are going to fire into that serotonergic, that pons area of of the brainstem. So, that's why they're relaxing. And that's why those ones are used in like EDMR for like counselors is to calm down the nervous system so that you can have a rational conversation without uh, that that huge fight or flight. Well, vertical eye movements, those nerves that, that move those eye movements are higher up in the brainstem and are more dopaminergic, alerting. So yeah, we can 
stimulate different parts of the brain by moving the eyes in different directions. And then two, different movement is going to stimulate more kind of the left brain versus the right brain. So then it becomes this huge puzzle of, okay, well, which combination of eye movements can I use then to, to kind of rehab somebody's brain um, after you've figured out what's going on with it? And uh, then there's quick eye movements. So firing your eyes to a brand new target. And that's going to be very frontally based. So your frontal eye fields are right behind your, your frontal <laughs> lobes, right? Right in that area. So it really kind of stimulates into that, that more intellectual, uh, conscious part of the brain as well. And then you've got these reflexes with eye movements. So yeah, when you turn your head, your eyes should kind of bounce. And that keeps you orientated. They lock onto a target, then find the next one. Lock onto a target, find the next one. Kind of like watching a train go by. Kind of like not being dizzy in the supermarket or in a busy subway station where people are moving all sorts of different directions. So there's these reflexes that happen too. So eyes, wealth of information. And uh, especially with that orientation to tell us where we are in space because there's nothing more... <laughs> kind of uh, taxing on the brain then to become disorientated, even to a little extent that we're maybe not aware of, um, it, it can really fire into those limbic centers and say, yeah, there's, there's a risk here. I might fall over or um, just not feeling right. And uh, the eyes too, um, basically uh, the reflexive movements um, are hardwired to your vestibular and proprioception. So feedback from muscles and joints and then from the inner ear. And this system is the most heavy myelinated systems in the human nervous system and the fastest pathway. And so that can tell us a lot about how quickly your brain is reacting to things. And if it's the fastest and most heavy myelinated, so that coding around this part of the brain, uh, the white tracks, then too, that takes a lot of energy. So the brain being the greedy master using about 20% of your energy, if you're wasting all that energy, just trying to stay on your feet or figuring out the outside world, you're going to become mentally fatigued. And in concussions, we see this, that people <laughs> don't feel right. And then they get into this brain fog and they're like, yeah, if I'm rested and sitting down, cognitive tasks aren't an issue for me. But when I get up and I'm trying to do a task and, and it's partway through the day, I crash, I tank. Um, yeah, it's because <laughs> we're, we're overusing this system that should be automatic and functioning and flowing and doing everything that we shouldn't have to think about. Man, I, I I really wish I I asked this question earlier. I mean, oh my god, this is I'm just so excited about about everything you're talking about. Uh, so yeah, one is I don't know where to begin. Thank you, thank you for that. I I want to talk to three hours about this. Um, but <laughs> yeah, we got a little bit more time. Um, one is you mentioned the horizontal movements of the eyes, left and right, left and right. Um, that we get in the yep. EMDR and, and sort of hypnosis and other things. Even when we're walking uh, or riding our bicycle or something, we naturally um, do this. And that is, um, you're saying that's kind of calming us down and activating the serotonergic system? More so, yeah. It's going to be in that part of the brain, right? In in that uh, middle part of the brainstem, your pons. Yeah. And uh, the, the thing about the brainstem is it it's it's not separated. It's It's a whole web of interconnected integration. And uh, that's why when you can stimulate one thing, it's going to kind of stimulate another function too in that area. And that becomes kind of the biohacking, neurohacking side of things is that, yeah, if I can couple some of these things together, then yeah, counseling becomes better. Um, or yeah, I can put them in a hypnotic state if I have a, the right tone of voice or the right sounds around me. And uh yeah, sometimes it's the the combination of these different different systems, different uh, ways the the nervous system works that that uh, really becomes that art form in in treating people as well. Or it could be that mistake where you overstimulate somebody. 
can we achieve the same um, kind of result with um, lateral, not just eye movements, but um, say actual other um, parts of our body, say like sound left, right, or um, kind of uh, moving our neck left and right, or uh, absolutely our legs or other our arms or something? Can we? Is that is that working the same kind of system, or is it only the eyes? No, it's all hardwired together. So that becomes the the beauty of it as well. Is that well. Um, sorry, before I go into the next tangent there and, and answering the question, um, moving limbs now is going to stimulate this big part of your, well, small part of your brain that has roughly about half to 60% of the neurons in your entire brain. And that's your cerebellum. So your cerebellum is responsible for coordination of movements and thoughts. And yeah, so all of a sudden, if we want to coordinate the brain and get it more into sync, then we're looking at kind of these complex flowing movements as well. And we can couple that with different eye, eye therapies and movements there with different sounds. Um, but the more we kind of stack on top of each other, um, the more taxing it is for the system though as well. So uh, we got to be careful not to do too much um, otherwise you'll go from getting somebody better to, to unfortunately them crashing again. And, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's that fine line in a peak performer, of course, they'll recover usually right away. And, right. Cause I was like, uh, I was imagining, for example, um, I mean, it's, the horizontal movements are just one one example, um, but that's yep. what, the one we're looking at right now. I was imagining, okay, we have these sounds going left and right, the eye movements going left and right, our arms swinging left and right, and it's stacking and stacking and stacking the whole body, but you're literally moving completely in the body way. Your whole body's just moving left and right and left and right. Yeah, I, I yeah. was thinking that must be better, but you're saying yeah, it might, that might have overload the system. That might be too intense. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, well, think about it. Like, uh, People have ran this experiment several times at nightclubs <laughs> and, uh, That's right. yeah. So some people can get up and dance and it's a, a couple songs and then it's like, okay, well that, that was too much. And then some people need to be on some sort of, uh, recreational drug to be able to do that for 24 hours <laughs> before they fall, fall to pieces. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just stacking like the same direction together. It might not all be like, oh, my whole body's going left, left, right, left, right. It's like with dancing and going to the nightclub. You're kind of like, this part's going down and up. This part's going horizontal. Here you're spinning around and you kind of combine these in weird recipes, these individual ingredients. Right. Um, and that creates different kind of results for better or worse. This is amazing. Yeah. And to go back to the whole idea of kind of reading people and, and the nervous system through movements. Yeah, you see it in somebody who's like a good dancer, how their nervous system's moving, that coordination uh, versus somebody who's maybe rigid and uh, inflexible. And then you're like, okay, rigid in movements. And then naturally you're going to be like, okay, well, if I talk to that person, uh, you can predict basically – how that conversation is. Is it going to be kind of more rigid, serious conversation or is it going to be this, this smooth flowing, bubbly personality, right? Uh, the, the movements and thoughts are very, they're, they're connected. So oh, yeah. it also makes sense why we're kind of why we're also attracted um, to these beautiful movements uh, to, to people who are dancing or uh, moving in a right. certain way, even the facial movements, all that. It's a very attractive thing as well. It's sort of a sign of health, um, it seems. I never had really thought about that, but it seems yeah. to be very obvious. Um, or, or falling over you at a train station, right? <laughs> I don't know what to even think about that. Like, uh, like no, like literally a woman, a beautiful woman just fell into my lap and I, and I didn't accept oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> my nervous system was like maybe my nervous system was like no you don't deserve her no it's more like okay she's falling uh let's be let's be civil human beings first of all um right yeah um uh, I, I I hope we got do you got another uh, a little bit more time I, I want to dig into a little bit more of this uh I, I'm gonna have to have you on again for sure but uh can we go a little bit more I don't know I'm getting greedy sure. fire away okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm so greedy. Um, can't get enough of David Hardy. 
so you mentioned the ver- vertical eye movements, um, up and down, up and down. Intuitively, I can see how up is stimulating, but you're, is down also stimulating or what's the difference between l- looking up and looking down? No, they're both, uh, they're both going to be firing into that midbrain area of the brain. Okay. And, uh, the way I've kind of worked it out in my own mind, and uh, this may be inaccurate to some extent, but if you think of kind of how we've progressed as animals, um, so if you're hunting and running, what way is your head and eyes going to be moving up and down, right? So if you're more in that movement, go, go, go mode, the eyes are going to have to react up and down. And then when you finally stop, and rest, you're going to be looking kind of side to side and around kind of in, in more of a calming area. So that can kind of be one way to look at it is that, yeah, as things progressed and, and, uh, became hardwired through all the, <laughs> the ways, uh, nature and life has evolved, then that could be a way to look at it. And, and also it makes sense because torsional eye movements too, moving it in, in torting or extorting, um, that rotational aspect is also higher up in the brainstem. So yeah, if you're moving around quickly and, and running and, and trying to track something down or run away from something, those are the eye movements that are going to be used versus once again, oh, I'm at the beach. I'm just going to sit back and yeah, kind of calmly look side to side, maybe follow something way out in the distance in the horizon, move slowly and just be at peace. This makes sense too with uh, with music genres. You think about like rock or metal concerts or things like that. People are jumping up yeah. and down vertically. They're bashing their head or what do you call it? Like rocking their head. Yeah. You know, <laughs> their hair is flying back and forth. They're up and down. Right. And then you look at like some other kind of more relaxing um, music where people kind of swing side to side, kind of relaxing. We, we naturally do this when we hear um, certain music or we want to calm down and the music is calming us down our body kind of uh, mirrors that, 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 that the audio out there. And then um, same thing with the sort of this more high energy music, uh, like rock and uh, maybe some hip hop, for example, electronic music, you might be jumping up and down or rocking your head. Um, That's, that's cool. And we don't intend to do that. We don't plan on, I'm going to move my head like this when I hear this music, right? Um, <laughs> but we just do it. And we're kind of like, we're yeah. kind of trying to get more into that, that, that mode, more into the music by, by moving our body in certain ways. Um, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, the, the rotational movements you mentioned, um, cause I have no idea how, how the, how these work. Um, but you're saying when we're spinning our eyes, like, you know, rotating them, um, that's kind of similar to the up and down in terms of uh, brain region. Yeah, it's going to be the same same nerves controlling those muscles that that move the eyes up and down are also the muscles and nerves and part of the brain that that would move the eye in or move the eye out in a rotational fashion, like a vertically rotational fashion versus once again moving them side to side. And um another uh, kind of exercise, I guess this is sort of combining different movements in particular patterns, is this smooth um smooth pursuit exercises. Yeah. You worked with concussions and head traumas. One of the eye kind of movement um, exercises that they use for this is um, these smooth pursuit exercises where you're basically kind of tracking this um, ball or this item with your eyes in a, in a particular way. Uh, and we naturally do this in our ordinary life as well. Well, first, how does this, why does this help people with concussions? And two, is there any benefit to ordinary um, non-concussed people to use these smooth pursuit exercises? Yes. Yeah. So um, let's go back to uh, the example we used with the concussion pre-screening tests. So have you had a history of neurodevelopmental disorder, ADHD, whatever? All right. So what parts develop first in the brain are going to be those primitive parts of the brain first? And that's why we always say, yeah, you're not getting car keys until the frontal lobes develop and your insurance money (laughs) comes down, right? Um, So yeah, the frontal lobes develop last. All these primitive centers develop first. Now, 
that kind of explains, well, if things aren't developing properly, that there'd be a weakness in this. So respiration, heart rate, uh, inhibiting emotionality, um, all of this are those primitive parts of the brain. And then two, kind of these brainstem areas and, and those primitive parts of the brain, they're more prone to kind of those whiplash shearing, twisting, torquing injuries that happen in a concussion. So it's once again, okay, well, what's the structure? What's the function of the brain? And then how does it not develop properly or how is it injured? And yeah, so yeah, we'd probably notice that the pursuits tracking or following an object moving becomes jerky. Well, that's not a smooth pursuit. That's not functioning properly. Okay, well, which direction does it fail or not function properly in? Okay, well, that's probably the the way we want to rehab it. Okay, well, what speed does it break down? And uh, then, yeah, we can start to really dive in and make it specific to, to how to how to treat somebody. Instead of just saying, yeah, follow this target side to side at this random speed, we don't even know if it might work for you. And uh, that's kind of the the theory in the like desensitization techniques after a concussion. Yeah, just follow it until you no longer get sick. <laughs> and yeah, I'm totally against that. I'm like, well, no, look at look at how the eyes are breaking down before you just fire some random treatment at somebody. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we can see that too. Like if things are working well and yeah, for the most part, you don't have any issues, then yeah, you can do different exercises kind of just like you would too, um, with, with anything like running or sport. Um, but if there is breakdown, if there is something not functioning properly, then, then we need to get specific and and do it that way. Um, so that's kind of, uh, kind of my, my point of view on, on the smooth pursuits. And, uh, uh, we can, we can go on for a long time just on different eye movements and, and then too with head movements, arm, limb movements, targets. And, uh, that's, uh, too kind of the world of, okay, well, how do we turn these into, maybe devices that people can take home and do, or how do we train people on the exercises clinically, or how do people uh, observe and, and notice in somebody else that they're working with um, whether there is an issue and, uh, and just, just build and build on it. Right. Yeah. We've got, we've got some technologies that can help with this. Uh, there's YouTube videos, there's um, different yeah. things like that. And then we have actual, uh, people like you to guide us along, uh, in person, uh, for example, or through, through video and through audio and stuff like that. Um, are there any, it seems like sports and some other natural kind of activities we go through sort of put us into, um, force our eyes into certain movements and, and force our neck and the whole body into, uh, force in a good way. Um, um allow mm -hmm. us to sort of enter that place naturally. Um, are there certain sports or certain activities, um, certain actions we can, I mean, we might be playing a musical instrument. It could be, it could be anything really, but I, I sports are what come to mind where this sport achieves this kind of uh, result, um, for the nervous system. And this sort of, this sport achieves a kind of different result. So if we don't want to do these little YouTube eye movement exercises or whatever, we can just literally play different kinds of sports or do different kinds of actions to achieve a similar result. I don't know if you've thought about it on that granular level of like the difference between some of these sports. Um, but if you have any ideas, this would be amazing, uh, material to, to know. Yeah, this, this is, uh, this fascinates me because, uh, absolutely there is. So let's look at like a long distance event, like running. Okay. Well, why do, why do people run long distance? And usually they're trying to get into that zone where they zone out. <laughs> right like that's that's the great magical thing about about running or or cycling long distances is that yeah you're doing something and all those thoughts kind of just disappear and you're you're feeling something something different right and uh 
I, I've done several different sports from, yeah, we mentioned rugby, um, basketball. Um, I've also done one full Ironman and, uh, and a few half ones. And uh, then mountain biking has become more of a passion to me. And all of them, yeah, they have a different effect on my psyche, which or feeling or nervous system or brain. And uh, the long distance one, once again, is that zone out one. And uh, when I first started uh, thinking that I could do a triathlon, I didn't know how to swim lengths. And uh, it was weird. It became, once I became decent at it and not drinking the swimming pool, it became very meditative. I, I'd forget which lap I was on. Um, it was just amazing that way. That zone out, not not know know where you are type type thing, and just feeling good. And then, uh, yeah, with the with the mountain biking, it's it's pure excitement, right? You're reacting, you're you're constantly turning quickly and having to make those those movements and jumps and react with speed. And uh, similar to what I feel when I ski, right? So it's that big vestibular visual stimulation there. And uh, then for some people, it's dance. Yeah, moving in different different ways to, to that beat, like you mentioned, with your head banging and uh, everything else. Um, and yeah, with contact sports, here is the funny thing. And uh, it, it will make more sense when, once you kind of hear it, and especially if you've been in a contact sport. Like uh, during the season when I was in shape and played several games and practices and, and tackling and hitting, uh, everyone would feel like superior. <laughs> like you'd have this great feeling about your body when you're not too banged up and uh, just this amazing kind of powerful feeling with you. And uh, when you don't, you feel soft. So in that off season, you, you'd feel soft. And uh, a lot of contact athletes have, have mentioned this, that, yeah, I can be lifting weights and uh, be even stronger than I am during the season, but I don't feel as hard. I don't feel, feel as good. I, I feel soft in comparison that I can't handle a hit. And that too is how quickly your body can react to being bumped. So it's not just the 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 muscles it's how quick the muscles reflexively move to those contact situations and it's a limited time in our lives where we could play that contact sport and feel that way <laughs> um <laughs> so <laughs> yeah and you're doing that together with other other nervous systems which just adds a whole new layer to it it's not just right. two people either it's <laughs> how many people it depends on the sport but god what a what a great tool that is, but also what a, what a scary, overwhelming thing that could be as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but too, you see, you see it in like boxers that, yeah, some don't wake up until they get punched in the face <laughs> and, yeah. and then they feel more alive. And then later in their career, once they've been hit and that system, that reaction is being overloaded and exceeded what they can handle, then they develop that glass jaw. And then the next hit, it could just be a little jab and they're knocked out. So in contact sports, it's such a fine line. And especially at those elite levels of how much good they're doing in training versus how much damage they're doing in, <laughs> in <laughs> to themselves too. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's that battle fine line. <laughs> yeah. I probably should be trying to close off this conversation, but um, just in case we don't have another chance, which which I hope we we, we will, um, I want to ask a couple other questions, which might just be opening up new cans that we can't close. Um, but yeah, one of them is um, <laughs> you're like, dude, look, you got to stop, you got to stop, stop, stop uh, asking so much. Um, yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. One is the um, is smell. I don't know if this is something you've thought about. Um, are there, are there ways we can use different smells to um uh, achieve any of this? Yeah, smells. Smells a great one. Um, it's basically uh, the only sense that fires that cranial nerve from smell goes uh, pretty much to our frontal lobes. 
So that's why different smells will, uh, will kind of alert us more. And, uh, they're more of those pungent smells that, that, that disgust type smell, mm. uh, will fire more into kind of the right side of the brain. And then, uh, kind of more of those pleasant smells like maybe lavender that make us feel happy and joyful, um, fire a little bit more into the left brain. Uh, so there has been studies on aromatherapy and, uh, different ways that smell excite our brain and, and our emotional systems as well. And, and make us feel, feel good or bad. And two, how smells can alert us and, and two being kind of more frontally based, how it can improve memory or when it's going wrong, how it's an indication that brain function is, is dying off and like your long COVID symptoms are in your Alzheimer's and dementia. So (laughs) it's, it's another one of those, yeah. Input into the brain. How's it processing and what's the output. So. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. We like, like, so we, we don't maybe have time to dig into all the details of that, but uh, yeah, thank you for that. And, and uh, uh, maybe I'll I'll ask you more about it another time. Um, One, one other uh, piece of the body, if you want to call it that is, is the mouth. Um, We use our mouth for, for, um, for talking, for vocalizations, but also just, we, we use our jaw in other ways too for eating, uh, et cetera. Right. Um, are there any kind of um, jaw, uh, mouth movements um, or or vocalizations? I know these are kind of two different things, but they're they're kind of part of the same uh, similar region that we can use to to change our nervous system. Yeah, so th- that's basically I divide that two ways. Uh, yeah, with the jaw and the jaw movements, you, you're stimulating a nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and that's going to be more, yeah, kind of excitement arousal. Um, so you think when you bite into something, yeah, you're using that, <laughs> that bite mechanism and every single animal other than us humans who have great fine finger movements and touch, uh, what do they do when they're mad and angry or hunting something? They bite. And when we're stressed, we, we clench our, our, we clench. Clench our jaw a little bit too right? Yeah. Yeah. Grinding our teeth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Being in that hyperactive state and when you're sleeping <laughs> and your teeth are being, being ground to, to find fault. It's not good. Yes. And I know on, on nights when I, if, if I drink alcohol, if I drink alcohol or had too much caffeine, I'll notice that um, I'm in bed with my, my jaws just clenched and that is not going to be yeah. a restful night. Yeah. That's not good. <laughs> And then on the other side of your question, there is uh, the muscles in the back of the throat. So yeah, midline musculature. Um, So think of your singing, your humming, and go back in time and think of your om. So you're chanting. It's got that that nice relaxation part to it. Um, So yeah, those, those nerves are, once again, lower down in the brainstem and you start to get a little bit more vagal stimulation with the, with that. Um, and, uh, that too is why, why singing can be therapeutic and then just those hums and ahs and two, when it falls apart and all of a sudden we have difficulty speaking, uh, that can also be diagnostic and they're coming up with devices that can tell, basically what's going on in your health by, by your, your voice as well. So sound recognition from voice. So it's, it's another important one. <laughs> final, final question. I think I, I plan on this being the final question, but you know, like we said, we don't, you don't sometimes choose what happens next. Um, uh, when you did that ohm thing, I felt almost like I was doing it myself. Not, not a hundred percent, but like I had like the 70% feeling of, Oh, I got a similar feeling as if I was doing it. Um, and so that got me thinking like with eye movements, with sounds, with all of these things we've been talking about today, if we watch or hear someone else doing this, does that trigger similar parts in the brain or how, how does viewing this and, and seeing it in others uh, affect our nervous system? Yeah, that's, that's going to be your mirror neurons. So you're taking in all this information from your outside world and 
a big part of the outside world is other people and those interactions. And yeah, we develop these bonds from, from infancy um, when we're looking at, at our, our mother and, and their facial expressions, whether we're safe, whether they're not in a good mood. <laughs> and we're constantly reading and reacting to that because it was just so ingrained with us from that early, early experience. And then, of course, when we're older, yeah, we can just walk into a room and sometimes not even really look at a person and be like, okay, well, I can tell that there's something wrong and then our state changes. So there is this huge, huge crowd mentality, right? Where, yeah, you're at the, you're at the, your favorite sports event and you feel the same thing as the person beside you. And, oh, wait, wait, it's too much. It's too much. There's a riot. <laughs> This is super powerful stuff, super yeah. powerful because, you know, we hear like you are what you eat or you are the average of the five people you spend your most time with. Right. Um, we literally are what we eat, but not just eating through our mouth, but eating through our eyes, eating through our ears, eating through our, our you know, movements and stuff. Wow. How, how powerful this, this idea is that we can change our nervous system through any of these inputs and we can help change each other as well. Um, Thank you so much for all of these different tools you gave us today. Um, it was a pure jackpot I hit, and I only I couldn't pick up all the. It's like I hit this pinata, like a, like a friendly pinata, and like <laughs> whack you. But like you know, you exploded all these you know treasures out, and I'm like kind of scrambling to try to pick them up and talk to them. But um, I, I got I got enough out of that. But uh, wow, well, what a, what a kind of like a happy birthday that was for me. It's not my birthday, but it feels like it. Uh, thank you so much. And um, you have a podcast, you have uh, your own services and all of that. The Hardy Brain um, is your podcast on Spotify and I iTunes and Apple Podcasts and all of that. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about, about your podcast and also about how to, how to connect with you, how to find you um, or any, anything you'd like to promote or um, share. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So the podcast, The Hardy Brain, uh, we're uh, one and a half, uh, two years old. Uh, oh, close to 70 episodes now and uh, all sorts of amazing guests, including yourself there. And, yeah, I'm coming uh, on. All right, well <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Probably was on when you listened to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you can find that uh, once again, uh, Spotify, Apple, Google, all of those. And yeah. Uh, the website is the hardy brain so i'll get that updated <laughs> and, and working better um but the easiest way to find me would just be through linkedin so so david hardy and uh or the hardy brain and uh okay. I, I look forward to, to hearing from from people and uh and uh building on on all the great conversations we've we've had about brain health and uh, and making the world a better place so yeah. I, I appreciate appreciate you, Michael, and, and and the work you're doing and and thanks for letting me geek out for a little bit and and uh, add some value to, to people's day. God, honestly, I'm happy to have you here for hours, tens of hours, but I don't want to <laughs> overrun your nervous system and time in life uh, or my own. <laughs> right? So uh, we'll just have to leave it for another time. I think this is a lot to chew on. Um, I think I'll even have to re-listen to this a couple of times myself. Um, yeah, your podcast is great. Your LinkedIn has a lot of great content as well. I'll, I'll link all that up in the show notes. Anyway, farewell for now. And, uh, thank you so much, David. Absolutely. All right. Take care.